Well, thanks for having me, and uh, thanks to all of you who've joined. Uh, um, my name is Ron Moore, and I'm a solution architect for top-down consulting. I've been at this S base and planning stuff for a very long time. Um, as you can see, my specialization is S base and planning, and I'm uh, kind of one of the usual suspects when it comes to webcasts and uh, K-scope presentations. I've been doing lots and lots of those. Um, I want to recognize um, three of my colleagues who um, contributed uh, information information for this presentation. Um, Ludovic de Paz, Paul Hawk, and Ken Ostrovsky all contributed material and advice. And uh, Ludo did a lot of the slides, including most of the section on uh, templates and um, CDTs, um, uh, or rather uh, DPTs. Um, he also built the app that we used for the example for most of the template section. Uh, so uh, thank you to uh, Ludo. Oh, Paul and Ken. Uh, K-Scope, uh, of course, K-Scope 18 is uh, the next one up next June. Um, the thing I like to say about uh, K-Scope is that um, it's a must-do for anyone who's serious about S-Base and planning and Hyperion in general. Um, the First of all, it's relatively cheap. It's about half the price of uh, public training, uh, public training in the, in the Hyperion world is 800 a day, 850 a day, um, and K-Scope works out to about half of that if you get a good early bird discount. Um, but probably more important than that is you're never going to find these um, uh, topics anywhere else. Um, you know, you, you just, if you're a beginner and want to go to boot camps and stuff, that's great for public training, big advocate of that. But um, when you get past that, there's no place to go except K-Scope. So I really think that if you're serious about this stuff, you really have to go. So go tell your bosses to uh, ante up and uh, uh, see you in Orlando uh, next year. OK, what's this session about? Um, it's, it's really about uh, getting to the next level with Calc Manager. Um, our end users frequently tell us that S-Base and planning allow them to spend less time on preparation and more time on analysis. That's a really common thread on the ROI of S-Base and planning. But the analog for us as developers and admins is that we should be able to spend more time building useful features and less time rewriting the same old code over and over again for every new scenario or every new currency or every new uh, entity, or for that matter, for every new project. So reusability gives us faster delivery and at lower cost, but it's also higher quality. It's higher quality because if you have used something a few times, um, you've, you've got some of the kinks worked out. So um, uh, reusability is really the key, and that's what we're trying to get after um, in this session. Um, reusability is only good though, or it's only higher quality if it's customized enough to meet uh, the specific needs. So um, customization and parameterization really starts with, with variables. So um, we're going to cover we're going to cover templates, we're going to cover design time prompts, which are essentially variables for templates. Um, we'll cover a few odds and ends about variables. Um, we'll, we'll go into custom defined functions, which is essentially just lots more functions to use in our, our, in our scripts. We'll talk a little bit about dynamic members because that allows users to customize the outline for their own needs to some extent. We'll talk about the debugger and log messages, um, mostly just because the, the debugger doesn't get enough attention, in, in my opinion. Um, and uh, last, we'll talk about planning expressions, which is um, really about standardizing our variables um, 
within planning. So what it's it, what's it not about? It's not about basics. We're not going to cover the basics calc manager. We're not going to cover the basics of business rules or calc scripts. We're not even really going to cover the basics of custom defined templates or um, design time prompts. Um, if you want some basics on CDTs and DTPs, I'm going to um, give you a link a little bit later to a presentation I did in um, 2015 uh, for OD Tug that goes through a lot of those basics. That'll come up in a few minutes. Versions. Um, I'm going to start versioning my presentations because I'm looking at other people's presentations and looking at blogs. I find myself asking, what version did they do this in? Is, is, is it available in my version, or is it available in the version my customer is using? So um, my um, VM, where I did most of the on-prem work, is 11.124, no patches. Um, the cloud material uh, is a bit of a hodgepodge between uh, the customers Ludo was working on earlier this year and the customers I was working on earlier this year. Uh, and, and as you know, the cloud is kind of rolling updates, so it's um, a little harder to pin down exactly when certain things became available. But I think everything I'm going to show here is, is pretty much early 2017. And a lot of it before that, a lot of what I'm talking about, uh, DTPs and, and custom templates was probably early version 1, 2, 11, 1, 2, 3. So a few odds and ends about variables. As I said, re reusability really starts with using variables. Um, so uh, here are a couple of um, uh, quick items. When, um, when I started working with a simplified interface, I was a little confused about the three um, places where users interact with um, user variables. Of course, user variables, um, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud, let users focus forms and the calculations that run on those forms uh, on the database regions germane to them. If, if I'm the US revenue analyst, I can focus, for example, on um, you know, the US and uh, in a user variable and have all of my forms forms um, uh, default there. So um, uh, that's a pretty key usability feature for end users. So um, there are three places we can interact with user variables in the cloud. If you look at the, the higher two, um, under tools, user variables, and under um, create and manage preferences, this is where users are going to make their selection for the user variables. Under variables, that's where um, you would create new user variables or uh, delete user variables. So uh, here's, if we go, and by the way, the um, this screen is called the navigator screen, and you get there by hitting the little three lines button um, in um, this little button, it looks like this in um, the simplified interface. Um, people call that the hamburger these days. Uh, so you go to the hamburger, preferences, uh, user variables, uh, options tab, and you'll see this set of user variables. Now, um, when you go to uh, here, you see pretty much the same set of user variables they are named a little differently. They don't have the module prefix on them. Um, the, um, but they're the same variables. And if I change them here, they change um, in the other screen as well. Um, on this screen, this is, you go to the hamburger variables, the user variables tab. Um, this is the same set of variables. If I change change them here, they'll change in the previous tab, um, but uh, in this case I've got the um, green and what would, when I select one, be red, uh, a plus and X to 
uh, create and delete them. Okay, a little bit about runtime substitution variables, uh, mostly because they're um, one of the newer implementations of variables um, and uh, not a lot of people have started using them yet. So they control substitution variables directly in a calc script. Uh, substitution variables have been around pretty much forever, um, but this allows us to uh, enter those values in the calc script. We can use them wherever substitution variables are allowed, and substitution variables are allowed across many, many components of um, uh, SBase and, and planning. There are uh, uh, calc scripts, uh, business rules, um, data load rules, if you're still using those, uh, um, uh, Maxl, um, uh, MDX, um, uh, FDMEE, uh, lots of... Um, uh, smart view, lots of places where substitution variables can be used. Um, there are counting substitution variables for scope levels for, um, I, I'm sorry, counting runtime substitution variables. There are four scope levels. Of course, we're used to the three scope levels for substitution variables of all applications or server-wide scope. Um, Application-wide scope, that is, all databases within an application, or database level scope, meaning um, only a specific database. And the narrower the scope, the higher the precedence. So if I have a current month substitution variable for all three of those, um, but it's different in my database, the database will take preference. So uh, when we introduce run runtime substitution variables, runtime substitution variables take precedence even over database scope. Um, the enable S, um, RTSV, RTSV, runtime substitution variable, uh, enable RTSV logging uh, is a CFG file setting that allows us to uh, push um, log information. Um, and we can use um, Runtime substitution variables in FDMEE to control data load related, related calc scripts. So an example or a couple of examples of data load related calc scripts might be, I want to clear data before I run a load, and then I want to ag that data after I run the load. And it wouldn't be limited to clearing and agging, but um, those are kind of obvious things that I might want to do. Okay, so syntax. Um, here's the uh, syntax from the uh, documentation. And so um, we say set runtime subvars within curly brackets, per, um, uh, semicolon at the end, the name of the substitution variable, uh, optionally uh, initialize a value, and then the RTSV hint, opening the tag, closing the tag, and our tag text in the middle. Here's an example. In this case, I'm setting up a start year and a start period, which we'll see in some in the code example in the next slide. Okay, so uh, here is, and usually this comes at the beginning of um, my script, um, so I can see my uh, tokenization, if you want to call it that, up front. So um, I'm going to work on my uh, inclusive left siblings. Um, and um, so for all my inclusive left siblings of FC start year, do all this. Uh, an additional if statement. Um, so if it's um, uh, the forecast start year and it's not a, um, uh, and if it's not the, uh, the start period through the last week, then do this. Uh, and then there's some other terms back here, but this shows you the usage of the runtime sub substitution variables. We can do this in um, Maxell. So here we're executing a calc script and we're pushing um, Maxell 
uh, we're pushing runtime substitution variables through Maxell. Here's the, uh, the syntax down here. Now, um, to re really get good reusability, we're going to want to push variables from component to component. So one of the things that we might want to do is have a batch script that sets our substitution variables and pushes them all the way through to calc scripts. So um, here's an example of some code that would allow you to set, um, uh, to prompt you for some substitution variable um, values. This is batch code. And of course, you can, um, what you see uh, here is the prompt, and that uh, fills the fir first forecast period value based on this prompt. It echoes back the value that was set, and then it launches Maxell, pass it, it launches the run forecast Maxell script, passing that um, prompted parameter. Um, and we're going to write um, a log file um, to that file name. Now, so, so we can initiate the value with that prompt, pass it into the batch code, um, pass that parameter with a dollar sign parameter to Maxell, and then pass that through um, setting a um, substitution variable or runtime substitution variable into our calc script. Okay, so um, the, the main part of the presentation is um, achieving reusability with templates and design time prompts. You know, reusability starts with simple stuff like, calc like variables and substitution variables and runtime prompts. The newer aspect of this and the more leverage or the additional leverage comes from uh, use of templates and the, the main variables for templates are design time prompts. So what's a template? Um, well, it's a, um, it's a wizard. Um, so the calc script developer creates a template and adds design time prompts to prompt the downstream I'll say administrator for certain decisions. So um, who would use it? Well, a developer who wants to do repetitious tasks. And um, one of those repetitious tasks that we have some examples of is a very repetitive currency conversion script. Um, so I might want to use a template for my own use or develop a template for my own use to just do repetitive tasks. I also might want to, as a developer, I might want to develop um, a template and hand it down to an admin. And I'll suggest that in this case, the distinction between a developer and an admin is a developer is an expert at writing calc scripts from scratch, and an admin knows basically what the calc scripts do, might be less comfortable writing them from scratch, and just wants to make certain choices to configure a calc script to a particular outline or per, per, for a particular task. Um, when would you use it? Well, anytime you have something that's repeatable but needs customization with different parameters. Um, this is the presentation I did. Um, I actually did kind of two versions of this. One was a January. This one is the January um, ODTUG webcast. And then I followed that up in, in um, January uh, 2015. Um, and then at Kscope 2015, I extended that with a, um, a further uh, presentation on sort of basics of CDTs and uh, custom defined templates and uh, design time prompts. So this is more of those basic keystrokes, uh, taking you from beginning keystroke by keystroke through how this all works. Um, 
I, I extend also this conceptual model there. Uh, when um, CDTs first came out, I had a hard time wrapping my head around how to really deploy them, how to really use them. So I can't, tried to come up with a conceptual model to st structure my thinking. Um, most of our planning and S-based models um, and the code they, that's associated with them follow patterns. And by patterns, I mean we all have dimensions with, with months, but it might be called period, or it might be called year total, or it might be called periods with an S. So I know it's out there, but um, I'm, not, I'm not always sure what it's called from outline to outline if I'm trying to get reusability across applications. Um, if we're doing currency applications, we all store our currency rates and other globals um, at a, a no dimension name, you know, like a no entity or no data type type member, or probably a um, intersection of three or four or five no dimension name member names. Um, but we don't necessarily from app application to application know how many dimensions are out there. Um, or from global to global, know um, which dimensions they are global across. So that's another example of a very common pattern with some need for customization. Um, we want to do things like uh, copy the latest month's actuals to the current forecast. But we don't necessarily know what month it is. So we don't know when our forecast start and end is. So these are the types of things that come up over and over again. So the questions we want to ask ourselves is, what's static? What can be prompted choices? And if those are prompted choices, now choices are things that aren't static, of course. And if they're prompted choices, who do we want to prompt and when in the process? Are they one-time choices related to the outline structure? That is, are they choices about what's the name of my accounts dimension, or what's the name of my entity dimension, or what's the location where I'm storing my currency globals? Or are they choices that end users are going to want to make? For example, what's, what is the entity that I am uh, responsible for, or what is the month that I'm uh, starting my forecast in. So uh, design time prompts are prompted when the template is executed. So this is, for example, when an administrator runs the wizard, they're going to be prompted, they're going to be asked some questions about, for example, what's your account dimension named? Or um, uh, which intersection is your currency rate stored at? Um, runtime prompts are then executed when the rule is executed, presumably by an end user. So runtime prompts, example, set my form to, um, to my specific entity. A design time prompt example, identify the account, data type, and version for my uh, average exchange rate. So a little bit of workflow uh, and my previous presentation goes into all of this quite a bit, so I'm going to just go through this quickly. First, we'll create our variables, our runtime prompts, for example. Um, then we'll create a, a custom-defined template. We'll drag in our script component, which we would have written ahead of time. That's the, the actual repeatable logic, uh, our, our real uh, calc script code. We're going to drag in any uh, fixes to um, isolate just the chunk of data or the slice of data we want to work on. We'll create the design time prompts. We'll create steps. The steps are the pages in the wizard, and we'll uh, locate our design time prompts um, uh, on those specific uh, um, pages. Um, we'll uh, look at our code in the in the um, 
repeatable logic up here, and perhaps I wrote that code hard-coded. I'm going to substitute my runtime prompts and my design time prompts for those hard-coded references in my um, hard-coded uh, calc script. Uh, then I'll create my rule. I will drag my CD, my custom design template into the rule. That will, or maybe my administrator will, the um, uh, uh, that will uh, execute the wizard. Um, I may want to then put some additional fixes around um, uh, that code. So here's a long list of design time prompts. I'm going to touch only on a few of these, but perhaps the ones that are uh, uh, most interesting. Um, and uh, one of the most flexible is the string uh, design time prompt. So um, before I get into the string, first a few comments about these first three uh, um, design time prompts. Um, those are out of the box. The application uh, um, the application uh, type is what sort of module it is. For example, is it a public sector planning um, uh, module? Um, the, the app DTP is uh, a flag for whether it's a standard multi-currency application. Um, the upper POV is the most interesting one. Um, this reads, uh, if you drop this um, uh, template, into a, a, um, a calc script, it'll read any upper fixes, that is, fixes before this template, uh, and um, eliminate those from the choices that the um, uh, user of the template has downstream. So why is that a good thing? Well, it allows you to deal with certain dimensions and um, not force your downstream admin to uh, deal with those dimensions. Um, okay, so let's say we want to create a template to do currency conversion for any currency pair as long as there's a rate populated. Um, notice the um, string DTPs here in the yellow. Um, um, My uh, periods DTP is going to take um, uh, something like a, a Jan colon December or a Jan colon June, but in some cases it might just be a single month, like just June. Um, so there's a structural difference or a format difference there that a string could handle where um, some other forms of DTPs might not be able to handle. My rate location um, might have any number of member names separated by a cross-dimensional operator, depending on the number of dimensions in the outline. A string DTP gives me that kind of flexibility. Um, okay, so the string's useful for specifying things like those cross-dims, um, and why would I want to just enter a, a big cross-dim instead of selecting it from uh, the member selector. Well, the member selector's got a lot of buttons to push and a, a lot of keystrokes. So going through, uh, finding it, you know, drilling down the hierarchy, finding it, um, uh, and going through all those dimensions, it's a lot faster just to type it in because it's probably something that I know uh, exactly where it is and I'm reusing this all the time. So here's the code that I'm going to drop this. Um, uh, these um, uh, DTPs into. So in the yellow are my uh, DTPs. So I got a target currency, and in this case I'm going to take target currency, multiply what's by what's already in there, and um, multiply it by my rate stored at my, in this case, end of month rate location for each block. So here's my Canada block, here's my Europe block, and then this goes on with the remaining blocks underneath. Um, so we're going to let the developer enter the location for that uh, cross dim rate. Um, here's what the um, uh, DTP 
summary page looks like after I've executed it. Um, the, the, the interesting parts of this are, uh, well, this is probably interesting. I'm going to take my um, 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 EPBCS um, stock start month um, 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 variable and uh, take it through December. Um, here's my cross dimension. Here's my cross dim to my rate location. Here's some. Here's my local currency, target currency, uh, average month, ending month, etc. So these are all selections I've made in the um, executing the DTPs. And here's the resultant uh, code with those choices um, expanded. Now, that's pretty simple. Uh, we can do some conditions. Um, so, um, uh, uh, how are we going to use uh, conditions in a, in a DTP? Well, well, why would we use conditions? Well, one reason might be that um, my, for my plan, um, I may not have um, closing rates. I might use all average rates for my plan rate. So in that case, I, I wouldn't want to refer to, I might not even populate my um, end of month rate. So we, we can add a condition. Um, there's a condition um, uh, component that I can just drag in. Now, I could also add an if statement manually in my code, but the, the downside of that is I don't get the visible um, uh, uh, graphical uh, representation of that branch. And I know a lot of people poo-poo the, the graphical calc scripts, um, but I've had really good success uh, um, using them in complicated development environments, particularly where several people are working on the same set of logic. Um, uh, and this really allows you to uh, compartmentalize your logic um, uh, if you embrace them. And it doesn't stop you from writing code by hand, um, but it really gives you good visibility and good documentation. So here's an example of uh, a condition that's been dragged in. A uh, yes answer to that condition uh, will take this branch. Uh, no answer to that condition will will take this branch. Okay, so um, we're going to drag in uh, two different scripts um, and um, uh, take advantage of um, uh, the simplicity that one template for two operations will give us. So in this case, um, I want to leave the end of month rate uh, empty. Here's the um, final code that that, that uh, template will generate. And in this case, it um, uh, allows me to um, do my plan with uh, all average rates. Okay, so now that's an example of where uh, missing data will branch. Um, so that's internal to the script. Nobody needs to answer a prompt to do that. So what if it's something where you want to answer a prompt to uh, that is answer a prompt, uh, a DTT prompt, a DTP prompt. Um, so the example here is um, uh, making a choice of a calculation type. And in this case, um, my, I, my two choices are a, a, what, what we call a straight percent of sales. So something is just sales times a percent. So like cost of goods sold is 40% of sales versus um, an increase rate. So um, maybe sales in my current period is prior sales 
is times uh, or times one plus a percent. So which method do we want to apply? So we could use a in the same uh, template um, choose one or the other based on a DTP. So um, here's the configuration screen. So we're going to give that um, uh, a DTP a name, uh, give it a Boolean type, um, give it some uh, prompt text, give it a default value. And we're going to um, um, check the uh, use design time prompt box in order to um, reference that design time prompt. So here's what the template summary looks like after execution. Uh, um, we've selected true, and in this case it happened to be the default. Um, and here's the account that we're going to use as the source. Um, uh, here's the account that's going to be calculated. Um, in this case, we um, used um, EPBCS functionality to allow for um, a dollar overrides. Here's the percentage account. So we could select all of those things and imagine an administrator who knows what accounts they want to configure and to be calculated. They know the source account, they know which account the percent is going to be in. But they maybe this administrator doesn't know calc scripts well enough to actually write that logic. So um, uh, this could be used when you add some more accounts or, or in lots of other circumstances. Okay, so um, in this case, the uh, sort of endpoint here there was a pretty complicated, um, um, a pretty complicated uh, series of conditions that allowed us to um, prompt for whether it's a straight percentage or uh, the um, growth type percentage, whether there was a, an override account or not, and whether our um, default percentage uh, were empty or not and that's the kind of stuff that um, it's not difficult to write really but it's a pain there's a, a lot of branching to do a lot of nested if statements and if you've got to do this on dozens of accounts it's a real nightmare to write so using templates we can do that um, uh, really quickly and it'll be very consistent Um, importance of default values. Um, so what if I'm, and this always turns up, what if I, I am um, three quarters of the way through the project and there are some changes and now I need to go back and change the underlying logic but, but um, uh, I don't want to go back and touch every one of the 10 or 20 places where this logic has been implemented with exactly the same um, change. So I can change my um, uh, template and we'll see in a minute how to, uh, to make that um, uh, flow through all the usages of that template. Um, but using defaults so that um, each instance has some place to go and so that that logic doesn't fail for lack of parameters is uh, an important um, uh, step to take. So this way you only need to change uh, specific instances. So um, in that case, um, we will have uh, many uh, instances of um, graphical components and going in and touching each graph component and editing it is going to be a big pain. So um, uh, in, in this example, I'm calculating net sales um, uh, with different accounts with the same template, um, but with different parameters. And um, 
I want to quickly update that logic. It, it, in the uh, graphical user interface, it would be quite cumbersome. So what I'm going to do is um, convert that to um, a, um, uh, a script view, which looks like this. And then I can either enter some of these parameters directly, or I can uh, pull them out to something like a Notepad++, uh, um, edit them there, and then uh, re-import them back. And um, that will make editing um, a lot faster. OK, uh, don't forget to deploy. Um, theoretically, once I save the template, deploying isn't necessary, though um, um, I, I've heard of instances of um, uh, flakiness um, unless you redeploy. So um, uh, I think it's a good um, best practice to redeploy. But you can redeploy all so that you don't need to go back and touch every rule. OK, a little uh, side trip into dynamic children. So what are dynamic children? Why are they in this presentation? Um, dynamic children are here because they allow users to um, um, modify the outline. So this is planning only. Uh, um, and a couple of instances, um, uh, we just did a workforce application where users wanted to add new employees that, and they added uh, groups of new employees. And some of those groups had different um, rates and different start dates and different end dates. Um, uh, um, and they didn't know how many they were going to add in each. So you couldn't just give them buckets because when they had different rates and different from start dates and different end dates, you can't put them all in the same bucket. So they needed flexibility. Um, uh, Ludo did a retail application where um, the users wanted to add new stores. So uh, the steps, configure the parent um, in uh, planning, uh, manage dimensions to uh, add or delete dynamic children, uh, create a business rule and point it to, um, or, or create an RTP that's pointed to to the parent, a runtime prompt, um, and um, uh, add a menu so your users have something to click on, and add a menu to the form. Um, so here's configuring uh, the parent. So um, uh, go to whatever member you want to allow new children for. Um, click Enable. Um, add a number of placeholders. So what's the upper limit? it on the number of new children you want users to be able to add. And I say that's an upper limit. That's an upper limit for each batch. You can then go back and do it again. Um, and, and by do it again, I mean run a refresh. And it will add a new bunch. And I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, inherit, in this case, inherit security. Now, if I do this step, um, Here's what EAS will look like after a refresh. Uh, that is, here's what the outline will look like in EAS after a refresh. I have these dummy placeholder names. Um, they have to be dummy names because no one, ha users haven't told planning what those names should be yet. Users haven't actually created them yet. So now we're going to create a runtime prompt and a business rule. So here's my runtime prompt, and I'm going to point that at that um, member name that I added the children to. I'll use the, that RTP in a rule, and I found the simplest rule that I could do this with was just uh, a single um, uh, fix, uh, a single global range here with that uh, uh, RTP in the, um, um, in this case, employee dimension because I want to add new employees and uh, then enable it to either create or delete um, uh, the members. Uh, validate it. Now when I try to validate it, if I try to validate it with the um, 
with a new member name, it fails because the member name isn't there in the outline. If I uh, run it with some other member, maybe one that has nothing to do with this process, it works. So, it, and then I can deploy it. So now I'm going to create a menu and add it to a form. So the key points here is I'm going to um, set the dimension that I want users to click on in the form, that is to right click on in the form. Um, I want to add the um, rule that this menu is going to execute, the one I wrote in the last step. Okay, now my, my users are going to execute this menu. So they'll right click on my, um, uh, uh, for example, new call center employee. They'll get, I, I did two of these, an add then a delete. So I hit add, it pops up this box, enter a new name. So I type in my new name and this is my May level two senior associates. Um, that gives me back the dynamic ad was successful. And there's my May level two senior associates. So if I go to a planning smart view connection, here's what it looks like. There's my May level two senior associates. But if I, now this only works in planning. It doesn't work on S-base um, databases. But I can cut, hit my um, planning application with an S-base connection. However, it doesn't get it. It sees the dummy member name. What if you exceed the allotment? I gave it three. The default, I think, is 10. Um, I haven't tried it with any more than that. Um, well, your user will get a, uh, that is, if your users, in our example, go past three, uh, your user will get a message, insufficient members in S-Base. Please contact your administrator to add more. And what add more means is run a refresh, and um, that will essentially finalize the three that had already been given names and it'll add three more placeholders. So you've got a new batch for users to add. There's some limitations um, and I'm, I'm going to speed up a little bit because I'm uh, running out of time. Um, Deletion affects all intersecting members. So imagine a U.S. user creates a new member called August Hires uh, and enters their data to the intersection of August Hires at U.S. The Canada member sees that member and says, oh, that's a great place for me to enter my August Hires, so they enter the data at August Hires Canada. The U.S. user later comes back and decides to delete that. He says, that's my member. I added it, so I'm going to delete it. He doesn't realize that the Canada member has entered his data there, and the Canada member's data, get, data gets deleted. So there's definitely some thinking you want to do about um, administration here and controlling uh, who uh, um, deletes. Um, this is uh, feature supported only from the web uh, version of the web client, not from SmartView. That is, you can't click on a form in SmartView the way you can click on a form in the web version. Okay, uh, custom defined functions. Uh, CDFs are about 250 additional functions for things like uh, launching encrypted MaxL scripts, um, uh, additional date calculations, additional string calculations, um, a few things that you can do with the standard functions, but a lot of things you can't. There are something like, I don't know what it is up to these days, around 140-ish uh, standard functions in uh, S-Base. There are uh, almost double that many um, uh, CDFs. You can write your own CDFs in Java, and there's a lot of good blogs out there about how to do that. Here's the documentation. Here's um, some sample code um, um, available on the um, Oracle site for the research. 
Here's a quick inventory. You can see that most of them are date and time functions, financial functions, or string functions. But there are a few other things in particular, like Maxell launch functions and MDX functions. So um, uh, date functions, one of the big um, uh, categories. Uh, so here's date difference. Some examples of when you'd want to use date difference is uh, in retail. Um, Ludo used this to um, uh, calculate the number of days open to calculate whether a store was a, a comparable store or not in order to, comp to calculate comp sales. Um, I've used this before for accounts receivable forecasting. Uh, how many days does it generally take this uh, customer to pay their bills? So now apply that same, you know, 35 days, 45 five days, uh, apply that same difference to their most recent invoices and forecast when they're likely to pay their open bills. Um, you've got date parts, day, month, week, year here, um, not unlike SQL date parts. Um, weekdays, um, great for other types of um, business date calculations. A um, couple of return types at default to uh, um, Sunday being one. It's, it's one through seven for the, the days. You can set Sunday to one, or you can set Monday to one, or you can set Monday to zero with using one, two, or three as the return type parameter. Concatenate, uh, very similar to the uh, uh, standard concatenate function, just add two strings together. Um, Check for a prefix or check for a suffix. What's the text? What's the prefix or suffix, depending on which of these you're using? Uh, padding out a text. What's the overall? What's the text? What's the overall length? Um, what are the? Is the character or characters to pad it with? Uh, append true means put it at the end. Append false. False means put it at the beginning. Maxell CDFs, um, one of my favorites. Um, here's what it looks like in EAS. Um, here's what it looks like in Calc Manager with a little more um, detail, a little more um, documentation about the, the parameters that you'll need. Let's see some examples. Um, it took me a long time time to figure this out. I feel like the documentation is really confusing. Um, so uh, I wanted to start really simple and build this up uh, to uh, more complex. So uh, steps. There's a, a couple of preparation steps necessary to, to take this through the most complicated example here. First, I'm going to write my Maxell script like this one. This is a really pretty simple, stupid Maxell script, but it gets the point across. Um, I'm going to generate uh, keys. This is standard Maxell encryption, um, and this uh, greater than keys.txt pipes those keys out to a file because they're big, long, ugly keys that look like this, and um, I need to be able to reference them, so I pipe them out to a file. Uh, then we're going to in, um, generate encrypted, um, for example, password tokens, which are um, also um, pipe out to a file. And then I'm going to execute my um, Maxell script. Notice the encrypted, and you know what? I missed the encryption step. There's another uh, encrypt Maxell script step that should go in here. Um, this is the decrypt, uh, there's a hyphen E uh, step that takes my um, unencrypted script, generates an um, encrypted MXLS version of that script. Here, there's the decrypt, which runs the encrypted version based on um, the key. Okay, so here's uh, some very 
very simple code. Now the pro and uh, I've used run type subvars up here to pass my parameters. I don't have to do that. I could stick them directly into the code here, but this I think makes it clearer uh, and tokenizes it. Uh, now the problem with this is that it would run. Um, this works without the fix. The fix isn't really a part of the necessary code, but uh, it would run on every block. I didn't test this, but according to the documentation, on every potential block. So we don't almost ever want to do that. Um, uh, so what I did is fix down on one block. So um, here's my example. Um, so I need a uh, calc member block. I a, um, uh, give it to calc uh, manager, um, execute maxl file. By the way, file means an external script, which I'll give it the script name here. Um, the, um, the other version of this, the maxl script version, um, allows me to embed maxl code right in the calc script code. Um, I think almost all the time we'd be using the, the file version. Um, here's the run Java. This is straight from the rather confusing documentation, um, but I wanted to um, uh, uh, get that out here to try to be complete in my presentation. But I think more useful is the next set of slides. So the most simple version of this that I could come up with was, here's my MaxL script. So a simple spool to write a log. Here's my log in. Here's some uh, stuff that I want to do. And I can uh, execute that very simply. I just say run Java with this um, uh, call to the functions. I have some um, parameters. Um, uh, I can optionally write a log file. This is whether it's uh, sync or async, meaning sync means run my steps one after the other. Async means just run them all um, uh, at, essentially at once. Here's the name of the script. Really pretty simple. But for some obvious reasons, we'd almost never want to do that. For example, we'd be exposing passwords. So um, let's pass some parameters. Um, let's do it very simply first. We'll use dollar sign parameters in our script and um, nothing new there, $1, $2, $3. We're going to do exactly the same thing we did before. My scripts are named and, so, uh, um, and files are named something slightly different, but exactly the same process, except instead of hard coding my login credentials, I'm going to pass those login credentials um, uh, from my um, uh, um, calc script to my maxl. Okay, let's take it a step further. Let's do it encrypted, which is where we really want to get to. It's exactly the same process, but we're going to use um, the private, uh, we're going to use the encrypted keys and encrypted tokens that we used before and we're going to use the hyphen D um, decrypt parameter. We're going to use those the S, the encrypted version of the script. We're going to give it the private key and then from our encrypted tokens, the encrypted username and the encrypted password. And here's how the MaxL script will use the um, past parameters. Okay, um, I'm about at the top of the hour. I'm going to just quickly rush through uh, some planning expressions because this is very cool stuff. Planning expressions are predefined functions and variables within in Hyperion planning that we um, standardize common tasks and can therefore make our applications more reusable. 
They include things like dimension names, planning ranges, and global storage locations. Here's additional documentation. Um, just to quickly go through them, um, get based on whichever scenario you're referring to in planning, and you know your scenarios can be set to different start year, end year, start month, and end months. So these will go get those based on the scenario name that you give it. So now you can parameterize your calc scripts to work with the local um, scenario planning ranges, the SPRs. Big improvement in reusability. Cross refs. Um, people refer to these as rate blocks. This is, um, I'm going to store this at no data type, no um, um, entity, no country, etc. cetera. Um, so these rate blocks um, uh, are, are global locations where we're going to store a lot of our you know, currency rates or growth rate globals, for example. Um, so um, using um, just account name will um, append a no um, to each dimension name it, um, except for currency period and year. Um, the um, no with a prefix allows you to customize the prefix. Um, no uh, prefix with a true, um, uh, it'll append all the dimensions including year except it won't, um, uh, it won't include currency and, um, and period. So there's a couple of ways to do this. Um, I think this is better to do in DTPs because that gives you a lot of flexibility but I don't think it gives you enough flexibility all your globals. Uh, for currency conversion, I think it's pretty good, but um, it depends on how many dimensions each of your globals is global across. Dimension names. This is a big deal because you frequently have dimension names, customized dimension names. So uh, we can start to standardize our dimension naming um, or, or, or refer to dimension naming with a standardized um, set of uh, functions. Uh, so we use dimension tag. So for example, we'd say dimension tag, dim name entity, and that would tell us what our entity dimension name was if we had changed it, for example, to cost centers. Again, it, it allows us more reusability, allows us more standardization. Periods allows us to go get the, uh, the months that are associated associated with each of these um, uh, types of periods, uh, number of years, number of periods in the uh, database. Some, some miscellaneous stuff, um, the currency app flag. This might be the most common planning expressions, open input value block and close input value block used for standard multi-currency applications. Um, it'll return a um, uh, uh, an if statement block, if it is a um, standard multi-currency application, uh, some other miscellaneous um, expressions. Uh, the, if you've worked with workforce, you know about the um, calendar TP index and calendar uh, fiscal TP index uh, used for um, standardizing the um, uh, time frames within uh, workforce. Uh, here's some examples and I'll uh, quit with these examples. So um, we want to fix on go get our, our start year based on our um, scenario RTP. So that would say which scenario am I working on? So if scenario RTP uh, expands actual, let's go get my actual start year and actual start month. 
Here's a little bit more complicated example um, where I go into, or actually Ludo went into um, the similar type of example, but also used uh, some CDFs to um, uh, work with setting time limits on uh, consultant employees. Um, uh, here in New York in particular, um, companies get in trouble on um, W-2 versus non-W-2 employee types if they keep part-time, uh, if they keep um, 1099 type employees too long. So um, here is a uh, set of code used to flag um, employees that have uh, 1099s that are coming up against their limits. I'm going to uh, stop there because we're over time and see if we have uh, any questions. Ron, I haven't received any questions yet. Okay. So that um, either means I was really thorough and everybody understood everything or, uh, or the opposite of that. So uh, um, I hope it's the, uh, the former. Um, if you have questions, my uh, email is uh, rmore. R-M-O-O-R-E at topdownconsulting.com. Please feel free to uh, email me questions. And um, I look forward to seeing you in another webcast. And thanks for attending. Thanks for being with us today, Ron.